Hello, and thanks for having me. This is me. for you. Is that for me? Thanks. Yes. Um, now for something completely different, perhaps, to some of the, the other tracks and presentations you've been in. Um, today we're going to do a bit of a gallop through change management because you've been hearing and you still will be hearing in the presentations of best methods, best practices, the best way of doing things, but it still remains that you can lead a horse to water but you can't make a drink. There are these problematic elements called humans that have to implement all these wonderful ideas that you're coming up with. So we're going to do a bit of a gallop through change management. Just briefly, we'll be looking at what change management is and how it differs from change leadership. We'll do a high-level overview of John Cotter's eight-step framework for change leadership, an overview of the change management process, and then the really interesting part, the psychology of change. What makes people change? What makes people resist? How can we predict what's going to happen if we can? Here's a wonderful quote. It's such a wonderful quote that I'd like everybody, please, to write it down. And how I'd like you to write it down is with your left hand. So whether you are doing it on a phone or keying it into a keypad or you're using good old-fashioned pen and paper with your left hand, everybody, now, quick, as fast as you can, write it down. Yes, you too. You in the back, I see nothing happening. Write it down. As fast as you can as accurately as you can. If I was going to be really mean and nasty, I'd carry on with the presentation while asking you to do that at the same time. Who's got it? Who's got it? Everybody? Anybody? You're almost there. <laughs> do we have anybody in the room who didn't even try? Oh, no. Uh, confession time. Why? I know I can't write with my left hand. Okay. So when we perceive that change is going to be too difficult, sometimes we don't even try. Who started and then gave up? Come, 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 come. I know it happened. Yes. What, what was your story? Why, why did that happen? <laughs> did it help that I was putting on pressure and say, go faster? Didn't. Uh, would it have helped if I'd said you're being measured on the accuracy of this and your, you, you know, your performance appraisal and your bonus at the end of the year rests on how accurately and quickly you did it? Would that have helped? Maybe, maybe not. Who circumvented the process altogether and didn't write and used a hack? I saw some people here with their cell phones taking pictures. Who did that? Why? It's easier and faster. People do what works. People do what's easier and faster. I told you to write it. I gave you a clear instruction. Everyone knew what was required. And some people still found the faster way of doing it. And that'll happen in change transformations too. So too often, organizational transformation is like this. People change only reluctantly. As soon as they can, they slip back into their comfort zones. They're grumpy that things were interrupted and that they were made to feel uncomfortable. Too often, enterprise architecture implementations or reinvigorations are like this, poorly communicated. You don't know why you're doing it. How does it fit into the bigger picture? Why should you have to do it? What's going to happen if you don't do it? So hopefully today you'll learn something about change management and how we can do it differently. Because after nearly 40 years of research, change leadership guru John Cotter estimates that more than 70% of organizational transformations fail because they aren't implemented holistically. There's too much of an emphasis on the technical side and not enough cognizance given to the human side. So what is change management? If it's not something you just check a box to get HR off, off your back, how do we get from here to there? There are, many I mean, there are many definitions about what change management is. I, I don't know that they always clarify the picture. Really, it's managing that, that human, fuzzy, muddy side of change. The humans who are going to be implementing your change. And it has some elements in common. It draws on multiple disciplines, psychology, behavioral sciences, business sciences, engineering, systems thinking. 
and is predicated on systems theory that nothing happens in a vacuum. If you, if you try and change one little aspect of an organization, that change is going to ripple through to the individuals in the organization and bounce back, echo back, and change what it is you're trying to achieve. When I was still a novice, a complete novice, because I still am a novice, to, to EA, um, and was battling to understand what it is, it was explained to me that EA can be understood as being the glue between IT and business. And if that's true, I think it's an epoxy. This Prattly Putty was invented in South Africa in the 1970s, and you had to cut the exact amount from each stick and mix it together, and then you really had a super glue that could glue the heaviest things together. Um, and so if EA is the glue that binds IT and business, I think it's an epoxy of the technical side of enterprise architecture best practice and change management of the human side. If you only use one type of glue, it's not going to stick. But if you use the two together, you might have something strong and lasting. So what's the difference between change management and change leadership? They have a lot in common and they over at, uh, overlap. But I think if this transformation in the organization was conceived of as being a train, then the locomotive engine is change leadership. That's what pulls you through into the future. You decide where you're going and you head off for that with lots of noise and motion and steam. But change management is about keeping the train on the tracks. It's about controls and switching systems and drivers and carriages so that we don't become derailed in the process of moving strategically to where we want to move. Sales are dropping like a rock. Our plan is to invent some sort of doohickey that everyone wants to buy. Huh. Well, the visionary leadership work is done. How long will your part take? Okay, how not to do change leadership. There's a table that lays out the, the, the core differences between managing and, and leading change. It's self-explanatory. Basically, change leaders work at a meta level, at the macro level. They, they deal with vision and they deal with strategy and direction. They, they are followed and their whole ga goal is to produce change, is to move the organization and transform it. But change managers work at a much more detailed level and their goal really is to produce stability and predictability. So there is an inherent tension that exists between change managers and change leaders. But if you only have one rather than the other, if you only have the change management, you're going to stay excellent but stand still. And we know what happens to organizations who do that. If you only have change leaders, you'll have lots of rah, rah and, and road shows, uh, but your product and your service offering might suffer in the interim. So John Cotter, and I encourage you to read his books, they're very accessible, uh, to round out your understanding. He lays out eight steps to leading successful change, which he breaks up into three main phases. In the first phase, you want to create a climate for change. He talks about generating a sense of urgency, pointing out to the organization the worst case scenario of staying on, on the current trajectory. There's a, a wonderful Chinese quote that I love. It says, if we don't change direction, we'll wind up where we're headed. And that needs to be pointed out to the organization if you're going to uh, transform. You establish a change team of respected persons from across the organization, people of influence, and you develop a simple, powerful vision that can be communicated in five minutes. If you can't communicate it in five minutes, it's too complicated, you need to simplify it. Then you engage and enable the whole organization, primarily according to Cotter, by communicating, by over-communicating, because that's how you get buy-in for your transformation efforts. And you empower action by removing obstacles for change, and by deliberately, strategically, creating your change plan so that it guarantees short-term wins, lots of quick short-term wins. That helps offset the, the naysayers. It builds momentum and it builds confidence in what you're doing. It's a bit like how a dolphin moves through the ocean. 
in, in lots of little leaps as opposed to how a whale moves. If you are planning an EA implementation or reinvigoration and you're going for the one big splash, you're going to struggle. You've got to break it down into small parts and, and the, the first little hops need to be really little so that people begin to believe in the change process. In the third phase, you want to anchor the change into the organization, in its leadership, in its succession, in its, sorry, we're still there, in its leadership, in its succession, in its culture, and constantly reinvigorate that change process. Maybe if you, if you hear nothing else from this presentation, hear this, that, that it's not a once-off, it's not a destination, it's not something that's ever really finished, it's something that you continually need to pay attention to. So then how about change management? Well, here's my question to you. How do you change the shape of a block of ice? Who wants to volunteer an answer? Chisel. Got some engineers here, yes? Chisel. Chisel. You chisel it, okay. I've seen ice sculptors with those enormous things and they can do miraculous things with chainsaws. But what happens if we have an individual unit of ice and we want to change the shape of that? Come on, guys. Huh? It's not hard? Yeah, I saw a hand somewhere there. Stand and wait. <laughs> Stand and wait. And then what happens is that the ice melts. Then we change the shape of the container, and we put the water in it and refreeze it. And that's what change management is about. How can we unfreeze the organization? How can we melt the individuals that the organization is comprised of? Put them in a new structure, new management structure, reporting structure, way of doing business, and then set that, consolidate that into the organizational culture. It's not the full story, it's the simple version, but it's a good place to begin. So in preparing for change, there are some things we need to do. Form the change team from across as many business units and silos as possible, this way from as many levels as possible and with buy-in and championing at the most senior level that you can get. People who have varied and complementary skills and what you really need to avoid is a technical skew. They need to be people who can speak language that business people understand. Understand the current scenario of, of what do we currently have, why is it problematic, what, what are the pain spots of that that we're here to fix. And in doing so, that's a bottom-up approach of listening, of consulting, of understanding, genuinely, not, not paying lip service to it, as, as in the cartoon. The more you consult, and the more broadly you consult, and the more genuinely you listen, at this phase, the less resistance you'll have down the line. If you come in with a top-down approach to implementing change, you're going to put up people's backs and get automatic resistance. Then you develop your preferred scenario. What do we want? And why do we want it? Why is it important? What will happen if we don't do it? And reset expectations. One of the things that people need to understand at this point is that change is coming. They have some say in how, but whether or not it happens is, is possibly not for negotiation. And then you create that clear vision around the core values, the core purpose of the organization that you can clearly communicate over and over and over throughout your transformation. It's got to be clear, simple, achievable, feasible, desirable. It has to target heads and hearts. Did you hear that, people? Heads and hearts. Okay, not just heads. It can't just be an intellectual message. It needs to touch people um, inside so that they want to change. And identify the obstacles to change. Those can be people, it can be an organizational culture that is risk averse or change averse. It can be legacy systems. It can even be the environment. We, we were at a client site recently, which is one of these modern buildings where sometimes you work from home and sometimes you work from the office. You come with your briefcase and you choose a desk and you plug in and you start working, which sounds great in theory. But the net effect was that the EA practice was distributed throughout various levels, literal levels, floors of the organization, had no sense of, of being a team, and nobody in the organization knew who they were. So sometimes even your physical environment can be an obstacle to change. And possibly the biggest one, we'll see why in a moment, is past negative experiences of change. Those are really going to be a big obstacle for you. 
In the second phase, in implementing change, you put together your change management action plan, consciously targeting leaders who may not think that, that this is something that involves them. People, responsibilities, activities, timelines, um, and planning for those short-term gains rather than the one fate to company. Then you create an awareness of what's going to happen, what the transformation is going to involve and why, and you communicate this within your EA team from EA to the business and understand that the communication is two-way. The awareness initiative needs to begin weeks or even months before your implementation begins. It's one of your strongest ways of, of managing and circumventing resistance. And it's got to be designed so that it's tailored to your, your specific audience. Um, I put persuasion there because this is not just about awareness, it's about sale, it's about selling. Um, it's in, in advertising they say, sell the sizzle, not the steak. I think in organizational transformation you have to sell the sizzle and the steak. But with love and respect, too often you guys sell the chemical composition of the protein, okay, which is not necessarily what the organization needs to, needs to hear or wants to hear or is, is capable possibly even of understanding. Training is a huge part. You assess what, where the gap is, what people will need to know. You, you design, you develop, you implement, and then you evaluate and you plow back what you've learned into the next iteration um, of training. It's an ongoing process. This is also not a once-off. It's something that you continually have to do within the organization as you find out what people need to learn. And then you empower action. Um, you are going to weave change at this phase and in the maintenance phase in every aspect of the business. So what you want to achieve needs to be factored into recruitment, selection, induction, every training program and coaching, job descriptions, performance management systems, KPIs, into business processes like budgeting and decision making. These need to be aligned. With, with the change and, and the values of the change that you're trying to instill into the design of the environment, the infrastructure, the applications and systems. And one of the ways of empowering action is to provide ongoing support. That too is not a once-off. Perhaps the most important one, and I've given it its own slide, is communication. John Cotter says, start way before you think you need to put together way more than you think you need to in terms of a communication plan. As often as you can, across as many channels, mass and individual. Now when you've got your training plan and you think that's comprehensive, multiply it by a factor of 10. Over-communicate by a factor of 10 because you actually can't over-communicate. You can't start communicating too soon and it's not something that you, you ever stop. It's multi-directional. It happens from the, the EA team, but also back to the EA team. You know, God or evolution or whatever your belief system says, gave us two ears and one mouth. And we should really be listening and speaking in that proportion um, if you're wanting your change to be taken up. What are you going to communicate? The EA vision and the broader transformation vision, if there is one. Process, timelines, expectations, what changes are going to be happen happening, what successes you've had, what challenges you've had. You need to be honest and communicate about those two and give regular updates to people. Communication is formal and informal, but systems theory teaches us that you can't not communicate. Those of you who are married will know the powerful communication of silence. Yeah, the silent treatment and you know that something is being communicated the problem is you're not always sure what you know when the cupboard door starts slamming and the pots are slamming and someone's ignoring you that's a problem in organizations you can be in charge of the communicating and the message you want to deliver or not but there's still going to be communication there'll be if there isn't a communication vacuum then gossip and rumor and fear mongering will flood into that vacuum to fill it you can't not communicate. It also needs to be adapted so that you, your different communications are relevant and targeted at the audience that you're sending them to. It's not so much about what you want to say, 
as it is what they need to hear. I'm not talking about soft-soaping the message that you're just telling people things that will make them happy, but it needs to be relevant to them. And, and often what we're communicating is what we want to say rather than what people would like to know. It also needs to be targeted to, to different cultures and languages. Uh, a while ago I was working on a, on a production pipeline re-engineering program. I was doing the change management side at a pharmaceutical company. And the pharmaceutical company had two main lines. They had what they called ethical med human ethical medicines, which were cholesterol lowering, blood pressure lowering, diabetes medications, and they had the agricultural and, and veterinary side, dips and that sort of thing. And they were actually in two different buildings on either side of a road that ran in the middle. And on this side where the, the human medicines were, the executives and the sales reps pulled up as a, you know, you know in the BMWs and Mercedes-Benz and they got out in their posh suits and their briefcases and they all looked like little Dale Carnegie replicas. And on this side they were all, we call them buckies in South Africa, you would call them pickups. Twin cabs and single cabs, mud spattered along the sides, the guys got out, they were men to a man, um, and they looked like farmers. They wore shorts and they wore leather shoes and big hats. Uh, you know, they had the farmer's tan and that's what, what they were selling and who they were selling to. We really were giving the same message to both groups. In fact, the pipeline was the same, whether you were making medicines for animals, I mean the machinery for animals or people. Um, but we had to package it as a completely different way of training, of communicating, of awareness, because these, these were two different groups, two different cultural groups, who didn't speak the same language, even though they spoke the same language. How not to do it. You won't read my technical report, so I summarized it in this complicated slide. If you stare at it long enough, you will either experience the illusion of understanding it, or be too embarrassed to admit you don't. Do you have any questions to betray your ignorance? I have a question. Is the triangle thing mad at the tube? You've been in that meeting, haven't you? <laughs> okay, so, so tailor your communications to your audience. In the third phase, we're looking at maintaining change. Palm trees are amazing trees, aren't they? They grow in sand with a minimal root structure to anchor them and they are at that point where the land meets the sea and weather is most intense. That's where hurricanes hit the land, that's where these, these storms hit the land. And over time palm trees, like certain people in certain organizations, have evolved a magnificent way of dealing with this. They go, oh here comes a storm and they do this, they just become really flexible and bend back and they let the winds of change blow over them until the storm is passed, and then they go back to exactly how they were before. And people will do that at an individual level, and an organization will do that. Oh, here comes the next transformation. We've had them before, and we've survived them. Let's just pretend we're going with the flow. And then when all the hoorah is gone, and executives are back at head office, and those blessed emails have stopped coming through and pinging my e-box, we'll just go back to doing business the way we know it works. So you can't just implement change. It doesn't stop with the implementation. It's an ongoing business of maintaining it so that you weave it into the, corp into the corporate culture. You identify and manage resistance. Where people are changing in the direction that you want them to, you catch them doing something right. You reinforce that and reward that. You collect and analyze the feedback and plow it into the next iteration of your change cycle so that the changes become embedded from recruitment and selection to, to the day that you leave and beyond in your succession planning. The psychology of change is an interesting thing. People can be told to do the right thing, they can be explained clearly why it's important and they can still refuse to do it. I, I love that picture. Um, because people don't work like operating systems. Okay, so let's look at some of the principles that guide change and resistance. How do people resist? Some people flat out refuse to change. No, won't do it, not gonna, not gonna happen. Some people pretend they're changing 
um, but come around from behind and do something to, to undermine the change or to keep going on the trajectory that they've always been on. Some people are yes butters, you know that one. I've got the perfect solution for you, it's X. And they go, yes, but, you know, I don't think that's going to work because. And then you say, aha, okay, well, Y will work for you. And then they say, yes, but, you know, we tried Y once before and it didn't work. And you say, right, got it, perfect solution is Z. And they'll say, yes, but our corporate culture, you know those people. In psychology, we call them helpless help, re helpless help rejectors because they tell you the problem, but they will never accept the solution. That's resistance. They might stigmatize the EA and change management programs um, so that you, your service offering is not respected, is not taken seriously. The, or they might flee, leave the organization, bunk the training, be absent at work. Those are all ways of resisting change rather than taking it up. Maintaining duplicate systems, warping the message in various ways, getting back at the organization, and these days even doing so publicly. So why do people resist change? Firstly, that, that's a cute cartoon. It's the essence of, of resistance. I'm sure you've heard people do that. In, in my practice, they say, fix me, make it better, but don't ask me to do anything different. Um, all right. Why do people resist? What do you think is the number one factor? Uh, who said fear? Ten points to you. Fear, 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 fear. People are afraid. Fear manifests as many things. Stubbornness, arrogance, often as anger. When you see an angry client in your meeting, know that underneath that is fear. Fear of instability, unpredictability, failure, being revealed to be incompetent at your core. Fear of comeback and sanction. People are terrified and then they cling to their comfort zones. Inertia is not just something that applies to cars, objects at rest or in a straight line. It applies to people too. They will continue in their comfort zone unless you have enough energy, enough of a motivation to move them into a new way of doing things. If your change effort, if your EA offering, is however phrased as a threat, people will go into fight, flight, or flee mode. Okay, a fight, flight, or freeze mode, where they resist you openly, or they run away from the transformation, or they just freeze like bunnies in the headlight. Either, in any one of those scenarios, it's not good for uptake of change. If people perceive that they have conflicting performance measures. They're supposed to do the job they've always done as efficiently and quickly as they've always done, but take on this whole new load of learning and doing things and upskilling. Um, and there's going to be no slack cut for while they are upgrading themselves, they're not going to do it. If they believe it's going to interfere with family time on a permanent basis, they're probably going to avoid doing it. A perceived lack of ownership or involvement. If the project is seen to belong to one business unit, one exec, if it's seen as being something on the side rather than as integral to the whole business, people are going to reject it, particularly if, organi if organizational politics are involved. That's one of the reasons why you want to consult and communicate as broadly and as deeply and as thoroughly as possible in the early days of the project. If it seemed to not benefit your little domain, your little piece of ground, and you yourself personally, people are not going to do it. Organizational politics we've spoken about. If there's a lack of trust in, in you as a change agent in the EA practice, so you have to be integrated in the business. You have to talk. People have to know who you are and see what you're doing that's right. Some people don't have skills and so they don't change. Some people can't learn the new skills and that needs to be managed. And really a perceived lack of incentive to change. That's what we call the WIFM. WIFM is what's in it for me. Not just what's in it for, I don't know, IT, EA, the business, but me. C can you bring home the benefit to the individual? That is what will motivate the individual to change. So these are some of the, the guidelines for change. What makes people change? How, how does 
their psychology influence people's rate of change. This is a photograph from South Africa where we have some interesting drivers. This guy's determined not to get his vehicle scratched. He's obviously very proud of it, and he's found that making it into a bumper car, a sort of Dodgem's car, really works. People do what works. Make sure that what you're offering them works. But more than that, they are doing what they are currently doing because it works. You look at it and you see something faulty, substandard, inferior, and you think, why are they doing it? This is clearly not the right way of doing it. It works. I'm sure we have some smokers in the organization. You know what? Smoking works. That's why people do it. It buys them a moment of relief or clarity or relaxation or takes them out into the sunshine for five minutes. They know why it's bad, but at some level it works. And so if you can't replace the need that people are getting with the current way of doing things in a better, easier, faster way, they're not going to change. They're going to keep on doing what works. Or they're going to circumvent it like the people who took the photograph when I asked you to write with the left hand. Wally, are you done with your project yet? I'll be done next week. You've said next week for seven weeks in a row. What makes you think I'm going to believe it this time? The first six times. <laughs> so, people do what they can get away with. Most folk have an external locus of control. Even good people, even wonderful people like you and me, will slow down when we know we're coming to, uh, you know, the place where the, the traffic police sit and are, are fining and measuring speeds. And then we speed up when we know we're safe again. People will do what they can get away with. And so they need to be monitored. They need to be managed. Um, they need to be made accountable for what, what change you're expecting to happen. People do what they are rewarded for and avoid what they're sanctioned for. Rewards can be tangible things, bonus, time off, um, everybody stands up and applauds, you get a certificate. But they can be a little bit more subtle, just attention, eye contact. Um, make sure you are rewarding the behavior you want repeated. If Joe Soap gets more attention, more kudos, more street cred, more popularity from resisting change efforts than from falling in line, guess what he's going to do? Okay, reward, catch people doing something right more than you monitor when they're doing something wrong. People do what's easiest. I call this convenience ensures compliance. You, you've seen public bathrooms. If the, if the bin is one meter to the side of the handrail, people just, just drop it on the floor. Make sure that the changes you are asking people to make are easier. Make it easy for people to do the desired thing, the right thing, and begin to make it more and more difficult, more and more of an energy expenditure to do the wrong thing. People are pleasure-seeking and pain-avoiding. There's an interesting thing in the human brain called the negativity bias. Basically, the human brain is like Teflon for negative experiences. Uh, no, it's like Velcro for negative experiences and like Teflon for positive ones. We are sticky for the stories of failure, past transformation efforts the things that didn't work last time, the little rumors and gossip we hear about how this new organizational change is, is failing or didn't work in this area or that division or that company or how this consultant had trouble at the previous client. Those stick in our head. And the stories of success and, and wondrous achievement just flow over us like water off a duck's back. There are evolutionary reasons for that. We need to be more sensitive to pain. We need to pick it up quicker. We need to trigger a fight or flight response quicker because otherwise we're not going to linger in the gene pool. If, if, you, are, if you have a positivity bias, you think it's a good idea to pick up a stick and poke a saber-toothed tiger, you're not gonna last really long. So that means people will always remember your failures and past transformational failures. And it also means that you therefore need to continuously communicate the good stories, the successes that are happening with your organizational transformation. Another reason why people might not change is that change hurts, even when it's desired. Those of you who've gotten married when you want to be married or moved house or got a, the job that you wanted, know that's really stressful. It, it 
demands a lot out of you. It demands adaption and it demands energy to the organization. So we have to believe that it's going to benefit us in the long term. I think it's great if you can change people's attitude and let that flow into the way that they behave, but it's not always possible, and it's certainly not the fastest way. We have learned in South Africa, there's been a lot of research from the United States, where we've had racially divisive histories, that you can, for example, do workshops with people on racial sensitivity training and work very hard at changing their attitude, and there is some kind of trickle through over years. But really the fastest way to change people's attitudes is to force the change, is to make everyone go to the same schools and ride on the same buses and swim in the same swimming pools, and then people change their behavior. The implication for EA rollouts, therefore, is that don't wait until everybody's attitude is changed and they're on board, because people learn by doing, and they overcome their resistance by doing and doing it successfully. Uh, those are signs from South Africa where restrooms were racially segregated in the past. Another reason why people don't change is procrastination. Roughly half the world's uh, folk are natural born procrastinators and that's why you need to design your project like a dolphin because, because if you say, oh, we're rolling out our um, transformation, our new EA practice on September the 15th, some people will begin moving on September 14th. Okay, so you want lots of little mini deadlines to get people moving. Change isn't consistent or predictable. There will be different rates of uptake in different individuals, business units, even different organizations. But because it's inconsistent and unpredictable and knocks people out of their comfort zones, they want control. The more they feel out of control, the more they seek control. See if there are ways that you can build some sense of choice or control into your rollouts because people are five times more likely to implement what they believe they themselves have chosen than what has been foisted onto them. We have a problem. Complete the sentence. The only constant is? change. Okay, so we know this. The business has to keep up with the changing business environment, the changing technological environment, best practices. But the problem is that excellent service, perfect widget production, actually flows from doing the same thing over and over again. That's where you get your optimized routines. From staying the same helps you deliver a better product, but then you fall behind. So we have a tension between these two between delivering the goods and changing. And that happens at the individual level as well. If you are continuously demanding that, that people in an organization change, they will burn out. Okay, they will, they will burn out and they'll leave and they'll take their skills and experience with them. You need to build islands of stability into your program so that the organization and the individuals within it can change, pause, catch their breath, regroup, optimize routines, perfect the new system before we initiate the next change. So instead of thinking of the only constant is change continuously, think of it as continually. You with me? Okay, as something that's happening in spurts. Change is non-linear. Um, you have step changes, you have plateaus, you have cycles. Sometimes it feels like a roller coaster. And it's not going to be the same for every organization. Change management is about maximizing your chance of success, not guaranteeing it. It's about trying to avoid the problems and prepare for them before you get there. Success breeds success. I'm sure there are people in this, in this room who have tried to lose weight. And what is the most motivating thing when you're on diet? What's going to keep you good today? Anybody? Then when a scale gives you good news, so you step on a scale, you've lost a pound, you go, oh, I'm on top of the world, I'm going to be so good today, grapefruit for me. Yeah. You step on the scale and you've gained half a pound, particularly when you were doing all the right things. What happens then? It's a chocolate cake day. Uh, so <laughs> success breeds success and failure breeds failure. So I guess what I'm saying to you is that Change needs to be consciously led, consciously managed. It's not some afterthought. 
people aren't some afterthought. They aren't some inconvenient nuisance in the way of your EA implementation. They're the reason for it. They're the main channel through which it's going to happen. We need to lead change. We need to manage change. And above all, we need to understand that people's operating systems are different to computers' operating systems and factor that into our projects. Thank you for your time. Can you join me up here, and then we'll see if there's any questions from the floor, Steve? There you go. So you've seen Steve already. So I, I'm guessing that one of the no-nos when you're doing change management is to sit down and say to someone, what you need to understand is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I've had that <laughs> many times. Yeah, I guess what you need to do is to sit down and say, tell me. You know, tell me about your problems, tell me about your needs, and make sure that you listen before you speak. Mm -hmm. um, and then try and tailor what it is you want to say to what, what they've given you, what, what their needs are. Yep. Spin. Mm -hmm. Steve. <coughs> Thanks, Joanne. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, you talked about the change needs to be not just an intellectual exercise, but affect, grab people by the heart too. Um, a lot of people don't like change, it makes them uncomfortable. How do you get their hearts? What kind of things can you do? You, you want to find out what motivates them, what their with them is, so that you can speak to that. And you want to find out what their fear is, so that you can address that in a more constructive way. Um, I mean, in our smoking example, if someone is smoking because it gives them a little rest or a break, is there some way we can replace that with not smoking, but that will give them the rest and the break and, and a little bit of time out? And you need to work that at an individual level and organizational, uh, organizational level and also business unit. How can we meet the emotional need for this person, whether it's to feel in control or to feel competent or to have a sense of achievement or a sense of meaning? Um, in ways that are aligned with the EA practice rather than working counter to them. Thank you. Um, uh, yes. You talked about the um, human palm trees, those mm. that duck change long enough for it to pass over and doesn't affect them. Do you bother to find a way to dig up the roots or do you just accept it as a case of survival of the bendiest? <laughs> <laughs> No, we, 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 want to prepare, we want to make it impossible for people not to change. So if it is really woven into the fabric of the organization in everything, every communication, every training, your job descriptions, your performance appraisals, your KPIs, your coaching, um, succession planning, then it becomes really hard for the palm trees to duck. Because even if they lean to this side, it's there. And if they lean to this side, it's there. It, it really needs to become, I guess what I'm saying is integral to the organization, not, not a pimple on the side of it. Okay, EA is not a pimple. <laughs> so are there types of people that are more amenable to change? You know, are salespeople more amenable than accountants or technical, you know? Is, are there any obvious characteristics? Or is it just random? Look, I mean, there are psychometric tests that you can do to find. I think something that might be important for this audience to understand is that there's probably a skew in EA professionals that you are early uptake people. You mm -hmm. like change, you like the new, you want to master it, you want to integrate it in what you already know. It excites you, oh there's a new version of X or Y or you, you, you're always buying the latest telephones and the latest software. But the whole world is not like that. You know, half the world is actually would rather stick with the old clamshell phone, because that way they don't have to expend energy in learning a new system. So it's a mistake if we generalize from ourselves and just expect that people will be terribly excited because we're giving them something new and better. Um, people will sometimes prefer to stick with the old, even when it's less functional, because it meets their heart need of feeling secure, feeling competent, feeling capable. So many years ago, I was doing turnarounds for small businesses that were in trouble. And um, I was talking to some of the people about how we might turn them around and help them. And I 
this idea and they said, that's not how we do things around here. <laughs> well, that's why you're going bust. Right? So they succeeded, they survived. Steve? So very similar one to um, uh, our accountants, or I forget the other one you used, uh, Alan, Sales. as an example, salespeople or accountants. Um, this will put you on the spot, Joe. Um, are women more embracing of change than men? I'm trying to think if I've read any theory on that. I, I honestly haven't read anything about that. I can't. Mm. I, I, I can't think of a of a, a sex difference on change. Just really, change varies between individuals. It's so individual, yeah. yeah. I think some cultures can be less resistant to change because they, they place a higher value on tradition and perhaps on hierarchy, um, whereas the, the cultures that are perhaps flatter and more democratic are, are po possibly a bit receptive to change. And that's true of nationalities as I think it is true of organizations. Mm -hmm. organizations. Mm -hmm. Some organizations are more conservative and what they, they, for example, I think if you were working in life insurance, uh, you want that to be a really steady ship that changes very slowly because people's pensions are invested in there. Right. Uh, but if you're in advertising, I think it would be really receptive to change. So a lot depends on the organization's culture. Yeah. Uh, another question. Uh, I've heard expressed that on average, in quotes, it takes two years to move or drive change through each level of the leader, each layer of the organization. Is this true or accurate in your experience? Oh, I think it's how long is a piece of string. You know, how hierarchical is your organization? How open are they to change? How tolerant are they of risk? Um, when you do your organizational readiness assessment and you assess the history of change in this organization, as well as the change itself, the breadth, the depth, the impact, the speed with which it's going to happen, how much is going to change. I don't think there's a rule of thumb for change. Again, I think that one comes down to the type of organization. Yeah. If you've got a, a very layered organization in mm. a very controlled environment, it's going to take a long time to go down. Others, also, if it's distributed. Yeah. Others will be quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last question I have here is, um, you talked about, um, I'm summarizing this I guess, yeah, you talked about rewarding the behavior, uh, the right behavior, um, which reminded me of like toilet training a dog. It but, is. Um, yeah, kind of that kind of thing. But in your experience, ultimately, what's the, what's the balance between carrot and stick? Yeah, it's interesting. There is a... a a continuum of how directive you are in your change management. Um, you, you know the story about when there's a fire in the movie house, you don't sort of say, well, how do we feel about forming a nice queue and, and exit? You know, you don't go softly, softly, you say, fire everybody out. Um, so there is a continuum in change management depending on in how dire straits is this organization, how vital is it that we change quickly, and how much resistance are we expecting? The quicker your change, the more you have to do directively from the top down using more of a stick approach. And there is a time and place for that, but you need to know it comes at the risk of provoking a lot more resistance. And sometimes the change is more palm tree. It happens, it happens really quickly. People fall into line, but then they gradually drift back to the old ways of doing it. The more non-directive approach where you go softly, softly and you try and win people's hearts and heads and you persuade and you make aware and you train and you communicate takes longer but you have less resistance because you have more consultation and buy-in um, and it tends to stick longer. Okay, well thank Excellent. you very much. That was completely different and I hope absolutely fascinating. I loved it but hope everyone else did as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir.